Hello friends, good morning and welcome to the EduSat Network. Our topic of discussion today, friends, is uh, Buddhist art and uh, to take this uh, topic further and to uh, discuss it, we have with us in our studio subject expert, Dr. Anand Bardhan, Assistant Professor, Delhi Institute of Heritage Research and Management and uh, sir, specialization includes uh, temple architecture, heritage management and museum studies. And friends, uh, with this very brief introduction, I would like to welcome sir to the studio. So thank you so thank much for being here with us. Thank you very much. Buddhist uh, art uh, uh, has great significance in the cultural history of India. Often uh, scholars describe Buddhism as a heterodox religion or uh, sometimes as a Protestant Hinduism. However, mm, it is not the reality because Buddhism, Buddhism as a great school of philosophy derived uh, the basic tenets of Sankhya school of philosophy. Buddha amplified it, ameliorated it and uh, made it a pragmatic social philosophy. So, uh, Buddhism as a school of thought occupies very important role in Indian history. Second important thing is that Buddhism was uh, for many years and for a very long time like a state religion during Maurya period and uh, during Kusana period also it received the proper tutelage of the king. This was, these were the two very important factors that uh, Buddhism got opportunity to develop uh, art and architecture which are uh, magnificent and uh, which actually laid the foundation for the evolution of Indian art and architecture. So, the contribution of uh, Buddhist art in the entire course of uh, Indian history has a remarkable role in uh, uh, giving great impetus to art and architectonic activities in entire Indian subcontinent. Buddhist art emerged basically in Maurya period. Uh, Ashoka, who was the, who is considered as one of the greatest patrons of uh, Buddhist art and religion in Indian history had installed large size columns in different parts of uh, uh, northern India. Of course, we have a Sokan inscriptions in South India, but no important evidence of Buddhist art of a Sokan period has been uh, reported till this date from South India or from the even the region of Maharashtra. So, the early Buddhist art emerged actually uh, in the Magdhan kingdom where chunar sand stone was used uh, as an important medium for uh, uh, the purpose of uh, making large size columns. We have uh, some very significant places where Ashokan columns have been found. These columns are monolithic and uh, they are cylindrical as far as uh, their uh, shape is concerned. There have been uh, found Mauryan columns made of chunar sand stone at Vaishali in Bihar. Then uh, Rampurva is a very important uh, Mauryan site in Champaran district of Bihar where two columns have been found. One column is surmounted by a bull while another column is surmounted by a seated lion figure. We have also two other important sites in the same region. Uh, these two places are known as Lauria Nandangad and Lauria Areraj. I would like to tell that Lauria is a colloquial word that is used for the pillar of the Ashokan time and it is denotative to the cosmic lingam because the word Laur is, uh, is uh, indicative of uh, uh, linga. This is also important to note that uh, since 
Morin period was the first period where a lot of experiment was done as far as the masonic work is concerned. Ashoka himself had shown very deep interest in it and some of the very important historical places like Sarnath, Sanchi, these were the places where very good number of uh, 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 Buddhist relics have been found. Sarnath was the place where uh, Buddha had delivered his first sermon and this was one reason that uh, early some of the early Buddhist monasteries were made at Sarnath. Then Sachi was a place uh, which uh, was associated with Sariputra and Maudgalayan, the two of the great monks of the period of Buddha who were enlightened beings and Buddha himself had accepted in his own life that he was immensely benefited by the uh, scholarship of Sariputra and Maudgalayan. So apart from uh, Vaisali, apart from uh, uh, Vaisali and uh, Sarnath, Sanchi was a very important place where Mauryan column has been found, Mauryan stupa was also made and as far as the history of a stupa is concerned, we may find that uh, stupas have been uh, numerously mentioned in early Buddhist literature as the most sacred object or the most sacred structure which was worshipped by monks as well as none. And the Soka has the credit of erecting uh, 8400 stupas in different nooks and corners of the country. So we can say that it was the Mauryan period and very specifically the period of Soka when the foundation uh, of uh, the Buddhist art was laid under the patronage of the king himself. And this is why the early Buddhist art in its nature is a kind of imperial art because it received tutelage of the Mauryan emperors. Apart from uh, Ashoka, we find that uh, during the downfall of uh, the Mauryan period, these activities might have stopped for a few years, but later on the, there was a, uh, there were made a great number of stupas even in the Sunga period. Here I would like to make it very clear that Buddhist literature has described Pushyamitra Sunga as a patron of Brahmanican religion and he had antagonistic approach towards Buddhism. This is not true because there took a great transformation during this in the Sunga period and the stupas which were made during a Sokan period by using mud or brick, they were transformed into great masonic uh, structures. And uh, stupa of Bharhut, Bodhgaya, Sanchi, all these three major stupas were actually be transformed into major lithic structures only during the Sunga and Satvahan period. What is significant about the early Buddhist art is its symbolism and uh, I would like to discuss how this, uh, this art form uh, received uh, has, has a remarkable uh, significance in, uh, in Indian art history because of its symbolism. So once somebody uh, views the pillar of Asokan period, the first views that comes to him is uh, all about the tradition of the Vriksha Chaitya which is described in Vedic literature. I would like to explain it that uh, Asoka had not experimented anything new, rather it was based on the Vedic tradition. Here in this particular pillar, we can see it is a cylindrical pillar and a high rise pillar which has been installed, uh, which has been inserted in the earth directly. There is no platform for it. So, in concept it is very much different from the Persian or the Achaemenid kind of pillars. Achaemenid pillars are square they are not monolithic and they are not directly inserted in the in the in the earth they are also part of the uh, existing uh, structures 
here we find that uh, this uh, uh, pillar is standing in the open sky, it is directly inserted in the earth, there is no platform made, made for its erection, its installation and it is not part of any structure. In this way, this column is entirely different from the Persian kind of pillars. Here, we will have to go into the profundity of the Vedic literature and we may find, one may find that uh, there had been a great tradition of Upa worship, that is a Vedic post which was worshipped during the during the Vedic period. Similarly, we find that there was a tradition of worshipping Indra Dhaja. It was also the worship of a pillar, worship of a post. Then we also find reference of Pitri Chaitya and Vriksha Chaitya, which have been described in Vedic literature. And uh, this establishes this very fact that pillar worship was quite common before Mauryan period. So, what Ashoka had done was, uh, was is important in two different contexts. In a structural context and in context of material that has been used, Ashoka was the first king who made massive pillars by using a stone and that is Chunar sand stone. Second important thing is that Ashoka linked it with the Buddhist in its Buddhist philosophy, the Buddhist spiritual ideas and in that way there came two major changes. In place of wooden columns, a stone made columns were installed which is undoubtedly a durable material which has existed up to our age. And second important thing is that Buddha give it a, uh, sorry, Ashoka give it a new philosophical meaning or a connotational meaning which, which pertains the ideas of Lord Buddha. So, uh, <clears throat> these were the two major changes. One thing uh, which is very significant about the making of these columns, these columns are actually very heavy columns. These columns uh, we are made of chunar sand stone. Earlier it was believed that it was at Patliputra that a royal atelier, atelier existed and there these monolithic columns were made. However, new discoveries reveal this fact that these columns were made in the region of chunar hills itself and there, there we have got debitas in great number that prove this fact that the basing, cutting and carving and also polishing of the stone was done in the Chunar hills. They were brought through the river uh, to different places and there they were installed. The most interesting point is that these columns uh, are having lustrous gloss which was earlier been called Mauryan polis. Many of the colonial art historians called it. Mauryan polis and then it was contradicted that there is no polis uh, uh, applied on that. L rather, it has been created, this gloss has been created by constant and rigorous rubbing on the uh, uh, surface of, this of these pillars. Um, there are scholars who believe that sandstone cannot have gloss even after so much of rubbing. And uh, at some of the places uh, studies are being made and um, the third opinion has come that probably some sort of adamantine glue uh, was uh, prepared and it was applied on that. So, it, it till this date it is a subject of debate and uh, nothing can be said in a very concrete manner that how this gloss was created. This gloss has also been reported in the Ajibikas caves of the Barabar hills in Bihar, uh, where also you find that the surface is very smooth and it is able enough to reflect the light that falls on, on the wall. So, uh, the Mauryan polis remains an enigmatic issue till this date for art historian. The uh, philosophical meaning of the column is uh, very significant. One thing 
uh, is very explicit that if the column, the idea of making column, installing column was uh, related to the Vedic fertility cult, it definitely symbolizes uh, the cosmic lingam uh, in one way. And in uh, another way, uh, it is uh, a column that probably signifies the great declamation, the great proclamation made by Buddha. Because if line is on the top of this particular pillar, if it is, it is shown seated on the abacus of the pillar, then it means uh, uh, this lion symbolizes Lord Buddha as Sakya Simha. In ancient Buddhist literature, Buddha has been described as Sakya Simha, lion of the family of the Sakyas. So, this the presence of lion definitely signifies the uh, presence of Buddha in symbolic manner and secondly, the uproar of lion is actually indicative to the Dharma Chakra Pravartan. The second important element that one may notice that below the abacus there is an inverted lotus kind of pattern and this inverted lotus kind of pattern has not only been significant in Buddhist art in later course of Hinduism and uh, in even in medieval times what we called Avangamukhi Kamal that was made over some of the mosque events. So, this very idea of making Avang Mukhi Kamal is, uh, is, is, uh, uh, not, is philosophically very significant. There are scholars who believe that this is not Avang Mukhi Kamal, inverted lotus kind of design. This is a Ghanta Kriti, it signifies a bell and bell means both the time and space. So, this uh, bell pattern or this bell shape design uh, actually is a symbol of time and a space continuum. Uh, we can take it as a among Mukhi Kamal as well and if we, we really consider that, that this is a among Mukhi Kamal, uh, we can say this uh, lotus actually is again linked to fertility. And as far as the mythical literature is concerned, we already know that Brahma had, for, had uh, uh, thrown a lotus bud uh, from the space uh, 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 on uh, from space to the earth, and uh, this signifies this signifies that the power of fertility that nature contains that has come from the space world. We know that water symbolizes, sorry, uh, lotus symbolizes many things. It is a symbol of female genital, it is a symbol of fertility, it is a symbol of birth, it is a also symbolizes its placenta with growth of a child in mother's womb. So, definitely this presence of lotus or the inverted lotus is remarkably significant in Buddhist art. If uh, somebody views the column of Rampurva in Bihar, there is a bull that is seated on the very uh, top of the Asokan column and we already know that it is the, one of the finest example of realistic art in India. This image has been, in, has been displayed in Rashtrapati Bhavan and uh, it was after the exhibition of 1948-49, this uh, Ram Purva bull that had returned from an exhibition in England, it was uh, displayed in the Rashtrapati Bhavan. So, now it is not at it, its original site, but this bull figure which was uh, installed on the abacus of a column at Ram Purva is again indicative to a column which has been described as a Vrishabha Chaitya. And I would like to make it very clear the presence of Vrishabha again links this Buddhist column with fertility cult because Vrishabha, the Brahmani bull and a young Brahmani bull symbolizes the male aspect of fertility. It is a symbol of progeny, 
it is a symbol of fertility cult, it is linked to different agrarian practices and the presence of this bull is also indicative to a popular agrarian fertility cult of that particular region. Among uh, the uh, columns, one column that we have got from Sankisa in Uttar Pradesh that has been found at a place known as Farukhabad. This column has a uh, uh, capital that is actually a, an elephant. This elephant capital or this Gajastambha uh, is again a very, very important philosophical uh, subject because this Gaja um, is, uh, is a symbol of the, of, uh, the vehicle of Indra. We find one of the examples of Mauryan art from Dhali where Gajatama has been described and Gajatama is uh, Eravat. Eravat is the vehicle of Lord Indra. So, Indra is related to fertility, Indra is related to downpour the uh, 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 to it is a symbol of rain, it is symbol of moving cloud and undoubtedly the moving cloud in a sky in a space is symbolized in Indian has been symbolized in Indian art by the Gaja because Ga the word in this uh, the, the alphabet Ga in the, uh, in the word Gaj uh, is uh, 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 symbolizes Gagan, it uh, stands for Gagan means a sky and Ja means Jan means birth, what has taken his birth in the uh, sky or in the uh, space. So, Gaja, it is believed that Elip, uh, Gaja has not born in this terrestrial world, it has born in the uh, space and uh, if it is philosophically int uh, interpreted, it is very clear that Gaja is indicative to the moving clouds in the sky and it is undoubtedly linked to, to the story of Indra riding Airavat. So, we have uh, Vrishabha Stambha, we have Gaja Stambha, we have Simha Stambha. Then we also find a very interesting uh, Mauryan capital, rather we have two capitals of similar kind and uh, these columns are basically, uh, 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 these columns have been found or these capitals have been found at two important places, uh, one is Sarnath and another is Sanchi. I have already talked about these two significant places, one place Sarnath which is close to Varanasi where Buddha delivered his first sermon that is known as the Madhyama Marga Pratiprada, the middle path and uh, it was delivered to the five monks Asaji, Vanji, Vappa, Bhadi and others. At this particular place uh, by Lord Buddha, uh, these bhikshus are known as Panchavariya bhikshu, the five great bhikshus. We may be uh, uh, acquainted with this fact that these bhikshus had earlier uh, suggested Lord Buddha not to go for uh, such an austerious uh, religious practice uh, the tapasya uh, because he was a prince, uh, he belonged to a noble family and uh, doing tapasya maintaining austerity and celibacy was difficult from a person who, who, who comes from, uh, a, 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 from a royal family. But Buddha practiced it and uh, he got the enlightenment. So, Buddha rushed from Bodh Gaya to Sarnath where these five Buddhist bhikshus, these bhikshus were staying. So, at this place we have a capital which is not a single lion capital, rather it has four lion capital which are seated back to back. I would like to show you the figure, this particular figure, kindly show the figure. Uh, this particular figure, figure is uh, um, from Sarnath which is also the emblem of 
government of India, there have been shown four lions seated back to back. We have already discussed that lion symbolizes Simha Satya Lord Buddha himself. Four lions here means they, uh, the voice of Buddha, the preaching of Buddha is echoing in all the four cardinal directions of this universe. So, this four presence of four lions is remarkably significant. These four lions are symbols of the four cardinal directions of the universe and these were shown holding, upholding the dharma chakra, a great will. If this great will be uh, is again a significant is a significant symbol in, in, in Indian art because chakra signifies the movement of time and space. Cha means chalati and kra means kramena which moves in a particular order. Indians believed that it is time and space that that moves in a particular order, it moves according to Rit, the cosmic order and so chakra is a symbol of time and space and also of the cosmic order. The third important thing one may notice here that on the abacus which is drum shaped, there are four animals and these four animals are related to the four great events of the life of Buddha. Gaja, the elephant symbolizes the presence of rather the entry of Buddha in the womb of his mother, means uh, it is a symbol of conceivement. Then the second important symbol is Vrishabh, which is a, which symbolizes birth of Buddha. The third important symbol is the uh, horse that symbolizes the great renunciation uh, of Lord Buddha, which in Sanskrit is known is called Mahabhi Niskraman. So, Buddha escaped from the worldly life, this is symbolized actually by uh, the horse. Uh, and the fourth one is uh, the lion that symbolizes the, uh, the uh, preaching of Buddha, the first sermon of Buddha. Uh, the fifth symbol that is chakra with 32 uh, spokes, it symbolizes the 32 Mahapurush Lakshanas and uh, this uh, symbol, this also symbolizes the dharma chakra pravar pravartan. Buddha turned the will of the religion, Buddha said ekha dhammo sanatana, I am preaching you the sanatan dharma only, but this chakra of sanatan dharma is not on the right path. So, Buddha had shown the right path to the chakra and in that way uh, this chakra depicted on, on Buddhist art is uh, of great significance. We in, in Buddhism there is another important uh, form of structure which we call a stupa and um, as far as uh, the reference of a stupa in Vedic literature is concerned, we find uh, reference of Vedic burials, uh, archaeologically this has also been established and apart from that we, we find lit in Buddhist literature as well and Pali literature all world, a stupa has been described as a stupa, thupa and also thuha. So, thuha means a heap of clay or heap of soil and so is thupa, it, is, it, is, it also symbolizes a mound, uh, a semicircular mound made of clay and uh, a stupa, this word can be understood in uh, uh, in terms of its etymological meaning and astavana stuti means prayer. So, stupa uh, is actually a structure which was made for the purpose of stuti, prayer, astavan or for worship. So, undoubtedly stupa was an object of worship and a monument that was worshipped. Here, I would like to explain that Lord Buddha 
when he was uh, in his deathbed, um, had appealed his uh, uh, pontiffs, very especially to a person like Anand, that uh, after his death, Anand and others will not consider him, means Lord Buddha, as a divine being, as an incarnation or as a prophet, because uh, Buddha himself admitted very candidly, he was just a human being, he was like a common man, he was only a teacher of his students and his followers. So, he will not be worshipped in iconic form. One and second important thing, Buddha will not be considered as a great incarnation or as a great prophet. So, Lord Buddha had already suggested and appealed his disciples that uh, there should be no image of him which will be created for the purpose of worship. However, Buddha had suggested that great persons who have contributed a lot to the society and who have played very important role in the enlightenment of the common people, they must be revered even after their death. And so, in their memory, uh, there should be made a stupas. And uh, uh, this was the reason probably that once Buddha was cremated, his skeleton remains and ashes were divided into eight parts and initially at eight important places a stupa was created. However, we find that great stupas were created not only in North India, also in South India. In North India, we have remains of three major stupas. One is Sachi, which was uh, um, encased with stone during Sunga period. Another great stupa is Bharhut in Satna district of Madhya Pradesh. The third great stupa was made at Bodh Gaya, where Lord Buddha had got enlightenment. Apart from that, we find a stupa in the Andhra kingdom, where at places like Amravati and Nagarjuni Konda, uh, stupas were made. We also find great number of monolithic stupas, which were made in the rock cut caves, the Chatyas. And then during Kusana period, very good number of stupas were erected in the region of Gandhar and Takshila. So, this stupa is a major Buddhist structure and it transcended Indian boundary. The Dhatu Garbha of stupa uh, was so revered, it was so auspicious that in Southeast Asia, Asia, uh, in Southeast Asia and in Himalayan kingdom, it was called Dhatu Garbha, means where the relic casket is placed within the stupa was called Dagoba. From Dagoba, there emerged another word pagoda and all major structure later on in Southeast Asia were called pagodas. So, stupas can be found even in Himalayan kingdoms today in form of chorten, where they, they are also stupas of their own kind. So, a stupa is a major structure you would like to understand uh, what are the significant features of a stupa. So, a stupa is semi circular in design firstly. The second important thing is that a stupa is erected on a platform which is called Medhi. And uh, in this semicircular mound, there is inserted a large stone column. This column is called ST. Above this mound, above this semicircular structure, there is made a balustrated pattern that you can see in this very figure that is called Harmika and above the Harmika, uh, there is Chhatrak. This Chhatrak is actually created on the ST itself. Then in four cardinal directions, there are made four Toranas and each Toran is linked by again a balustrated uh, a stone um, uh, post and railings. These posts and railings are called Vedika. So, as far as the structure is concerned, stupa has 
uh, comprises a, of a large platform that on that a semicircular mound is created. This is a stupa of Sachi and inscription describes it as Maha Chatya Giri. Giri means a parvat, a mountain, it is mountainous in its outlook. So, it has been called Giri. Sometimes a stupa is called Chatya. I would like to make it clear that early inscriptions have very explicitly mentioned and uh, more importantly, it is the stupa of Sachi Vallip that has been described as a Chatya. So, Chatya uh, means uh, a, a place which is uh, related to the burial remains or the skeleton remains of a, uh, of a great son, saint, a great monk or a great nun. The word Chatya has originated from Chiti or Chita. That means the mortal, it is indicative to mortal remains. Uh, however, there are stupas of different nature. There are stupas which contain the dhatu garb, the relic casket having a skeleton remain. This is called sarirak stupa. The second stupa is paribhogik stupa, where in place of dhatu garb, some of the utensils and objects used by a monk or a nun is kept. So, it is called paribhogik stupa and then we have, we have uddeshik stupa means we have a votive type of stupa also which were made just for the purpose of worship. So, there are three categories of stupas. First one is saririk, this is the most popular form. Second, uh, uh, in, uh, in the history of early Buddhism, it was the most popular form. Later on, votive stupa became much more popular. The second stupa is paribhogik stupa and third stupa is uddeshik stupa. So, uh, these are the uh, three very significant uh, categories of stupas. I have already told you that the Sunga art is very significant in one way. Uh, it was supported by the common people. In modern art, we have uh, in terms of modern art, we have discussed already this particular issue that it evolved under royal patronage. While the modern art, uh, while the Shungan art was people's art, it was supported by common people, traders, businessmen who gave munificent uh, donation to the Buddhist monastery, Buddhist Sangha. And this was how we find a spurt, a spate in production, in making of stupas and also chatyas. Uh, especially on the trade route uh, that connected Uttarapath, the northern trade, trade, trade route with Dakshinapath. So, basically on trade routes, we find that in coastal region that great number of Buddhist structures were made and at Sachi, we have got very good number of inscriptions which described about the, the traders and businessmen called Srenik, Nagmak and Sharthwas, they are they were giving tremendous donation to the for, for making of stupas and other major structures. Apart from uh, Sachi, we may see the photograph, photograph please. This stupa uh, is uh, uh, significance again in terms of uh, um, the gamut of symbolism that it presents and uh, a kind of highly appealing uh, art form that emerged during this period. This is the architrave of the uh, Sachi Stupa where a nude female figure with uh, uh, who, is, who has been shown in a very seductive pose has been shown uh, supporting the column and almost hugging or touching the, the tree laden with fruits and flowers. This image is often identified as Sala Bhanjika. We find reference of Sala Bhanjika and also Amra Bhanjika in Indian literature and uh, in, in uh, Indian art, this is a very, very important figure again 
it symbolizes to the ancient fertility cult. The woman and nature both uh, uh, have power of progeny, power of procreation and uh, this is why a woman has been shown holding uh, a tree laden with flowers. There is this, uh, there uh, are references that when a woman uh, uh, holds the su such a tree, they bloom, the, uh, uh, the flower, flowers starts blooming and the fruits starts growing and this touch, this hugging and this kissing of uh, this tree or pouring wine uh, in its roots uh, is a, is a, was a popular uh, uh, practice uh, that was done by the pregnant uh, woman. This is a, a, a very remarkable significance that uh, remarkable reference that we, that we find. Uh, we also get reference that pregnant women used to go for pusp avachayan for uh, plucking flowers or uh, on collecting flowers in the udyanas, in the gardens and um, in that way they, they, they were made elated by um, uh, her, uh, her, uh, her friends and uh, uh, these uh, references uh, actually uh, are uh, important because uh, in the art of uh, Sunga period, we find that Yakshis have been represented, Salabhanjikas have been represented and uh, these concepts are already in the, in, in the contemporary literature. The first Salabhanjika figure that, that uh, uh, the ancient one, the most ancient uh, figure of Salabhanjika has been reported from Patna and it is preserved by Patna Museum Patna that is the bifacial Salabhanjika. But the second important Salabhanjika has been made on the columns of uh, on the Torna of Sanchi. We can also find here the figure of moving elephant, it has been shown in a very realistic manner. And third important thing one may note on the architrave is the uh, spiral design made um, at the uh, uh, made over this architrave. This uh, spiral design actually signifies that there are much more uh, stories to show. Probably it was the artist was inspired by the Patachitra tradition. This is the assumption of some of the uh, scholars. Apart from uh, uh, Bharhut, Sanchi, there is another great stupa that was uh, excavated uh, at place known as Bharhut in Nagod division and uh, now uh, the district headquarter is at Satna. Here we find that even Vedikas are well decorated. At Sanchi, there is decoration on Toran, there is decoration on Architrev. But there is no decoration on the Vedika, while at Bharhut we find that the Vedika had been very beautifully decorated and we find there is a depiction of Sahasra Dal Kamal, multi petaled, petaled lotus design. Again this is a very, very important symbol in Indian art and uh, this emerged during this this period, the Shung Shatvahan period itself. Uh, one of the inscriptions at Bharhut very clearly describes that it was made during the Sunga period. The word Sungan Raje has been depicted on it. These Yakshi figures and Salabhanjika figures are linked to fertility cult I have already described. One may uh, see this figure of Chanda Yakshi which is who is undoubtedly this Chanda Yakshi is the greatest heroine of, uh, of the Bharhut art and it is one of the most remarkable figure of Sunga Shatvahan period. One may see in art historical terms the, the apparel that she is wearing, the uh, uh, jewelry that uh, she is wearing, then we can also see her bangles. And apart from that, the hairstyle, the long braided hairstyle is there. She has been shown 
holding a solid tree, but one of her hands is indicating towards the mother, uh, towards her, her stomach or this is undoubtedly um, symbolically very important, because uh, the presence of Yakshi who is in contemplated mood, see, she is standing in Tribhanga uh, in a seductive pose, she has been shown holding the salatri, one of her hands is indicative towards her genital, but uh, at the same time we find she is in a contemplated mood. So, uh, this kind of references have been traced out uh, in Vedic literature also, where uh, uh, a woman uh, has been shown, uh, has been uh, has been described uh, as a symbol of uh, uh, as, as a um, as a symbol of uh, uh, procreation and progeny. So um, these kind of you know uh, symbols and uh, uh, figures were quite common during this period uh, in, uh, in Buddhist art. One very important issue that I would like to explain is all about the two great stupas of uh, Amravati and Nagarjuni Konda. These two stupas were different in their uh, outlook from the stupa of Sanchi, Bharhut and Bodhgaya. The reason is that they were made of uh, limestone. Some of the scholars think that it is white um, kind of marble, but this is not the fact. You can see the under or the hemispherical mound is well decorated, there is no toran as such and at the front there have been made five aryak astambhas. These aryak astambhas are symbols of panch dhyani buddha. So, in this way you may find a significant uh, difference between the stupa of South India and North India. Apart from that, there were made great number of chatyas by the Buddhists and we have places like Bhaj Kondane, Pital Khora, Nashik, Azanta, Bhattuparalu, Ghanshal, Poni and many other places in western India where chatyas having epsidal form means the frontal part of the nave is rectangular why the rear end or the lower end is actually semicircular. These kinds of uh, stupas, uh, these kinds of uh, chatyas were made and these are actually colonnaded naves. You can see the columns made in a series with very heavy capitals on the top and the ceiling is barrel vaulted. It appears that before this period, a structural chatyas were made by using wood, they were being made by using brick and other materials. And so, the ceiling was made by using um, what we can call uh, wood, uh, which, were, which were used for giving it a vaulted shape. This barrel vaulted kind of uh, ceiling of these uh, uh, rock cut caves are very interesting, because we find there have been made grooves also for fixing up wood, wood was not required here. Here the ridges and the ribs that you find in the ceiling, they are, they were also not to be created and columns are also not required, because this is monolithic one. But this entire plan and design and the architectonic elements of structural chatyas were copied here for decorative purpose. And of course, every chatya contains a monolithic stupa. Since this is a Hinayana chatya, we find that there is no depiction of Buddha. In early Buddhist art, Buddha has not been represented in iconic form. I have already quoted the various story related to death of Lord Buddha. These uh, uh, you know chatyas uh, are not only having uh, uh, beautiful interior, the exterior is also uh, 
uh, very uh, impressive and we can see the facade of this particular um, Chaitya. Uh, this is the Chaitya of Bhaza, one of the earliest Buddhist Chaitya that was created in Western India was Bhaza. There are scholars who are also of this view that a lot of experiment was firstly done at Pithal Khora, where we have some natural caves and a, a caverns and beside that we have a long series of small as well as large chatyas which were created. You can see here that the, on the facade there had been made balconied kind of structures with balustrated designs and there is a massive gateway which is, is arch set which we called cave dormer kind of design. This cave dormer kind of design later on in Indian art became symbol of a auspicious structure called Chaitya. If you somebody sees these, these facade were sometimes decorated by wonderful figures, very interesting and very impressive figures. And as far as the beauty is concerned, as far as the, uh, the uh, architectural significance of this magnificent Chaitya is concerned, the Chaitya of Karle in Maharashtra is considered the best among the Hinayana Chaityas, which were made during Sung and Satvahan period. And uh, there is inscription at that has been found uh, depicted on the walls of on the wall of Karle Chaitya. It describes Guha Yam Karle Srastam among all the Guhas means rock cut caves. The best one is the Chaitya Hall of Karle and there we find these two wonderful figures which are representative figures of Sunga period and Satvahan period. The body is full, it is corpulent, if you will see the male figure and even female figure if you will see it has broad pelvis, pelvis, very heavy thighs, heavy breast and this heavy breast, broad pelvis and, bro and very heavy thighs of this woman actually is very significant. You may find such kind of depiction in Mathura art, you may find such kind in de depiction in other schools of art, in the art of Sanghol also you may find such kind of figures. These kind of female figures which are not realistic, rather they are idealistic. And why the breast has been made so uh, heavy and rounded in shape and pelvis also rounded in shape and broad? Because the artist has given emphasis on the maternity aspect, on the aspect of progeny, on the aspect of procreation, on the aspect of fertility. So, this, this dominant fertility cult of that region even uh, infused a very creative strength in the sculptural art uh, of uh, Buddhism. We may also find that uh, these Chaityas uh, Grihas were made uh, in uh, different parts of uh, the, the, the country. Apart from that, what is uh, significant is the emergence of uh, um, very, very interesting chatya at place like Ajanta and I would like to see, show you the, the very figure of uh, Ajanta. Um, the Ajanta school of art is remarkably significant in the history of Buddhism. The reason is that they were made in a series 29 caves, they were made in two different uh, uh, phases. The early caves like uh, 10, 11, these caves were made during 2nd century BC, that it was the Hinayana phase in that Buddha has not been, uh, Buddha figure was not main because idolatrous practices were not common in Buddhism. What had happened during 1st first, first century AD, a dominant cult of Chatya Pujakas, Chatya Pujak emerged in Andhra Pradesh and then Another cult named Sarvastivajin also emerged and became popular there. These two cults had transcended the boundary of Andhra Pradesh and they had influenced the architectural activities at Ajanta. Later on we know the Mahayana cult emerged and which accepted Buddha as a great 
incarnation as a divine being and then images of Buddha were made in the art school of Mathura, also in Gandhara, in Sanghol and then in other parts of country also Buddhist Buddha images of Buddha were introduced. There is an interregnum of almost 3 to 400 years at Ajanta, where the art in the very first stage can emerge during 2nd century BC and continued maximum up to 1st century AD. And again in Gupta and Vakatak period after integral of 3 to 400 years, the Mahayana art emerged at Ajanta and during this period highly decorated, profusely decorated facades were created as Ajanta. You can see how beautifully the cave dormer on the top has been made and the cave had been added with a pillared porch and in all different niches which uh, uh, the bas relief figures have been beautifully made and they are typically typical example of uh, Gupta uh, sculptures of Gupta period where the diaphanous drapery is very very clear very much visible in this particular is in this particular form. One may see this is a typical Gupta image and the diaphanous dra drapery uh, that has been made which uh, uh, was not only made at one particular place, rather in all schools of art. The Gupta Vakatak idioms of art were was ubiquitous in entire India that can be said and uh, whether it is Sarnath you can see the diaphanous drapery is there. So, during Gupta period there emerged several great schools of Buddhist art that of course, stood over the foundation uh, uh, of Buddhist art which was led by the artist of Mathura, which was led by the uh, artist of Gandhara and which was also uh, aggrandized by the artist who had, who had worked at Sanghol. This is considered as one of the finest example of Buddhist art where Buddha has been depicted with a large size Prabha uh, Mandal. This is Padma Patra Nibha Prabha Mandal. It is richly decorated with lotus petal design. And if you, you can see the uh, hairstyle of Buddha, this is a typical Ushnisha with the Kuntal Kes Rasi with the curly hair. And the face of Buddha, oval shaped Buddha, can also be seen. The eyes are Ardhon Milit Netra, half opened eyes and uh, then we can see the slender and uh, body with uh, slender body of Lord Buddha and that is covered by a typical tunic. This is wonderful example of the Sarnath, uh, Sarnath art. So, Buddhist art in ancient time reached to its apex at uh, Sarnath with uh, um, uh, all these important uh, facts about Buddhism. I, I want, I conclude my lecture lecture here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much sir. Uh, indeed it was a very interesting and a very wonderfully uh, depicted uh, uh, lecture for us, uh, visually very appealing. And again uh, friends, is we are going to be able to also see it on YouTube as, an, as a very uh, useful source uh, for us to consult when we uh, discuss and talk about Buddhist art. So uh, friends, yesterday we had discussed uh, Hindu temples and their architecture. So if you would like to see that, then that would be also a very interesting source. Again, um, thank you so much sir for thank being you. here today and uh, thank you thank friends you for watching. Much. Have a wonderful day.